Hello and welcome to episode number 15 of the Scottish History Podcast. My name is Owen Innes and welcome back to those of you that are just joining us for the first time. I do always recommend that you go back to the beginning and start from episode 1 and work your way forward. Um, This week is going to be a little bit different. I wanted to try something a little bit different. A lot of the subjects, of course, that we've covered so far have been a little bit heavy, uh, especially with the uh, the last few episodes, of course, with the Jacobites, Culloden, uh Highland Clearances and all that sort of thing. So I wanted to kind of take a different little spin this week. And what I wanted to do was, was try something with you. I wanted to try um, a kind of movie review I suppose in a way uh, a lot of people first heard about Scottish history or the stories of Scottish history um, about 25 years ago and that was of course with the movie Braveheart now of course with the real story of William Wallace etc we've already covered that back in the earlier episodes but what I did the other night was I decided just to, to sit and watch the film and by sitting watching the film I then kind of went scene by scene and went through and went through the mistakes etc that were made in the film Uh, because there might be somebody online who searched Braveheart rather than just simply William Wallace so they might find this podcast and then go back and listen to the real ones um, or the real stories. So I thought I would give this a little go and we'll just see how it uh, how it goes basically. Um, at the end of this podcast, there's going to be a, a little announcement as to how I'm going to be continuing forward from here. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But here we go. We'll give this a try. Sort of movie review of Braveheart and, of course, the mistakes, etc. that were made within that film. Um, so basically, the opening scene... You don't need to go that far into the film uh, to find the first mistake, and it's the opening scene, uh, Fade from Black, 1280, uh, apparently, uh, Alexander the Third died, which of course we know he did not. Um, of course, the music as well. The music is, is absolutely incredible throughout the course of the entire film, but the main instrument that you can hear is called uh, the Aelin Pipes. Now, these are Irish bagpipes not Scottish bagpipes uh, the Aelin pipes were chosen because they were less harsh sounding apparently uh, which I, I do agree with I think the Aelin pipes are, are amazing uh, type of bagpipes uh, the difference between Aelin bagpipes and the Highland bagpipes that most people would be used to is the Aelin pipes are filled using or the bag uh, is is filled using a bellows underneath your arm rather than blowing into the bag. The chanter, which is the part which you play the the main melody on as well, is um, has a higher range or a wider range of notes on it. I think uh, Highland bagpipes you can only play one and a half octaves, and on an Aelin pipe, I'm sure you can play between two and two and a half from memory. Uh, I have a set of Aelin pipes in the house, but uh, yeah, rubbish, absolutely rubbish. Uh, both me and the quality of the pipes that I bought, but but there you go. Uh, another thing that we notice as well is that the Scots are wearing kilts. Uh, kilts were not invented then. Uh, tartan was. The chances of anybody uh, really wearing tartan on a grand scale like in the film is uh, is not going to be true. Uh, so there's there's just a few uh, beautiful scenery throughout the course of the entire film. Mostly the film was filmed over in Ireland, not in Scotland. There are quite a few scenes, though. Uh, I, I was under the impression that not many of the scenes in the film were filmed in Scotland. However, there are a few. Glencoe, uh, Bucolet of Moor, etc. in the background. And I know that a lot of it was filmed up near Glen Nevis which is just at the back of Fort William, uh, between Ben Nevis and Fort William, really. Uh, we also get the name of 
William Wallace's father given as Malcolm and the son as John. Uh, from what I remember researching, William Wallace's father's name was Alan and his brother's name was Malcolm. But there we go. Um, when we first see the English army, we, we find them wearing matching uniforms. Uh, again, this would not have been the case back in the thirteenth, uh, 12th and 13th century, or even the 14th century as well, pardon me. Uh, there would have been no real uniform as such. This makes sense in a film, though. Uh, the Scots wear kilts, that's their uniform, so you can tell them in the midst of a, of a grand battle that's going on, and you can tell the English. It's, it's as simple as that, really. Uh, so that does make uh, make sense. And then we meet Brendan Gleeson's character. That, of course, is Hamish, the big ginger guy. Um, Hamish, or sorry, sorry, this is the young uh, Hamish, pardon me. Um, but regardless, Hamish didn't exist. There, there was, William Wallace's best friend was not called Hamish. Or, well, we certainly don't believe so anyway. We believe that uh, Hamish was an amalgamation of numerous characters within Wallace's life, including Andrew de Morey. So that's where Hamish kind of falls into things. Uh, so Wallace's brother and father were killed in the film. They were likely killed, but not sure where or when. More likely when Wallace was older and Wallace was studying to become a priest. Uh, the firstborn son in the family at that time went on to become a soldier and the second born son uh, went into the priesthood so uh, William Wallace was probably studying up in Dundee well we know that he definitely studied in Dundee and we think it was uh, possibly for uh, the church um, and it is most likely that he then became this freedom fighter to avenge the death of his father and brother so the next scene we see young William Wallace um, with the braided pigtails um, at his brother and father's funeral and a young girl reaches over and picks up a thistle and gives it to the young William Wallace. I mean, picking a thistle is possible. It's going to hurt because thistles are very prickly. Um, it's going to really, really hurt you if you try and pick one of those up. Uh, originally, in the script, it was supposed to be a rose, and then um, a lot of the, the Scots that, that read through the script said, uh, you can't do that because the rose is the national emblem of England, the thistle is the national emblem of Scotland. Uh, interesting little fact, if you don't already know this, the flower of Scotland is not the thistle. The national flower is the bluebell. Um, the thistle is just an emblem uh, believed to be from the time of uh, Alexander III, the Battle of Largs, and the soldiers, uh, the Viking or Norwegian soldiers, crawling through a thistle patch uh, that alerted the Scots that the, uh, the Norwegians were advancing upon them uh, due to the whelps and yelps and cries for help that the... Uh, soldiers were giving so the thistle um would unlikely have ever been picked it's a nice little gesture in the film uh thistles are gorgeous uh they're beautiful uh i believe they're they're referred to really as weeds they're not flowers as such they do flower but they they're, they're more considered to be weeds than flowers interestingly as well the girl that plays the young murren in the film here is um the girl that plays, or the woman now, uh, that plays Elizabeth de Burgh in Robert the Bruce, the, the film that has Angus McFadgen, who plays Robert the Bruce in this film. Uh, she plays his wife, uh, which I found really weird um, on so many levels uh, that that was the case, but uh, just a, an extra little fact in there. Uncle Argyle, he didn't exist, uh, but you can't have a Scottish film without including uh, the um, the amazing Brian Cox and Wallace did actually speak Latin as well we, we see him um, listening to Latin he, he doesn't understand and he does say that um, I don't understand uh, he did eventually speak Latin um, but again he's been depicted as a young boy at this particular time and 
in the background of the funeral scene, we see a man standing over the graves playing the bagpipes, playing the Highland bagpipes, overdubbed with Aelin pipes. We then jump forward and see the the man that we become that we come on to learn is is Edward the Second, Edward the First's son, marrying the Princess of France, Isabella. The marriage between Edward and Isabella did not happen until 1308, which was three years after the death of William Wallace. And at the time of Wallace's death, Isabella was only 10 years old. So she was only 13 years old when she married Edward II. And then we see Edward I giving permission for the um, the English soldiers who were taking over Scotland at the time uh, they were given privilege of prima nocte or prima nocta. So the, the original, the first scene says prima nocte, uh, and then later on everyone refers to it as prima nocta, which basically means, I think it just means the first night where the highest ranking sheriff or chief or whatever gets to sleep with a new bride. This was never introduced in Britain. Uh, to our knowledge so this again was just a, another way of being able to move the film forward and then we meet angus mcfadgen or robert the bruce for the first time he's introduced as the 17th lord of annandale he was only the seventh lord of annandale not the 17th and then properly introduced to the adult murren uh, if we are to believe a partner of William Wallace, then Marion Braidfoot would be most likely. However, Marion is similar to, or is a similar name to Robin Hood's Maid Marion, and there can be lots of comparisons, uh, or lots of comparisons can be made between William Wallace and Robin Hood to the point where, uh, I mean, I was convinced for a long time, uh, still am convinced that, that the stories of Robin Hood uh, were based upon the stories of William Wallace. Uh, if anybody wants to learn more about that uh, in a future, maybe just for a little bonus episode, uh, then please let me know in the in the comments, etc., uh, or send me an email or whatever. I'd be more than happy to go through the ones that I uh, that, that did convince me. But um, we believe that the name was changed because at the time Robin Hood was was quite a popular character in the film in the film world. You know, you had. Uh, uh, Kevin Costner's Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and then of course the the absolutely classic one of the best Robin Hood films ever made, Robin Hood, Men in Tights. The film then makes out that Wallace only wanted to be a farmer, uh, which again is is very highly unlikely. Most likely he was going into the priesthood. Uh, he was more likely to be an instigator of any war as retribution for his father and and brother's death um so again he's 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 been depicted as just simply wanting to be a farmer he just wants uh, you know some cows or a or a croft or something like that it it he doesn't seem to want to be involved in any way with what's going on um the first straw that broke the camel's back was was the death of his brother and father and then uh, later on in the film, of course, the the death of Murren. Um, it is most likely it was the death of his father and brother that that really got him all riled up uh, to to go ahead and fight. Now, if Marion Bravefoot uh, did exist and was a partner of William Wallace, then that again might have been another reason why Wallace fought. However, the reason why Murren is married, uh, sorry, Murren in the film is is murdered is to get Wallace to fight. Uh, Wallace was probably already an outlaw by this particular point if this is true history. So if Marion Braidfoot was killed at the hands of the English army, Wallace was probably already an outlaw by that point because that point is really the turning point of the entire film. I, I, I it it went from Wallace one day wanting to be a farmer to then being the head of a guerrilla army. Uh, it was a very, very quick transition within the film. I think a lot of things would have built up um, by that point. There is a story about uh, William Wallace and some fish. Some English soldiers tried to rob some fish from him and he killed five 
English soldiers. No matter how many people that you'll hear that story from, sometimes it's three soldiers, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's ten. You know, it's it's a long list. But the the idea that um, Marion or Murren is killed and that's why Wallace came into things is highly unlikely because we're not entirely sure that Marion Braidfoot even existed at the time. So um, that's where we stand on that. Wallace was already an outlaw. Um, we then see quite a number of English soldiers being introduced. We, we never really hear of any of them by name, uh, but the first of the characters likely being introduced is William Hesselrig, the Sheriff of Lanark, an area known for Wallace residing. Lanark's just outside of Glasgow. Um, if you're heading from Glasgow towards Edinburgh, you'll come across Lanarkshire. So uh, Wallace does end up killing Hesselrig, uh, but again, what for is not understood. Was it because of the death of his father and brother or, or Marion, etc.? It's, it's, it's all uh, up in the air there. Uh, the next scene with Wallace arriving, um, so Marion's been killed and he arrives on a horse and he puts his hands up and an English soldier comes up to the horse with the reins and grabs the reins and then Wallace pulls a mace out of nowhere. Don't know if anybody's familiar with the, uh, the film Die Hard where John McLean uh, walks in with his hands up and then all of a sudden he's got a gun strapped to his back. That's what that reminded me of. That did not remind me of anything that could have happened within Scotland's history, but it did remind me of um, possibly the greatest film ever made, uh, Die Hard. So, and uh, so Wallace is known for killing this William Hesselrig, the Sheriff of Lanark, and uh, we do believe that he chopped Hesselrig in half lengthwise, uh, rather than just uh, slicing the throat there. This might be a little bit graphic for some listeners. Uh, I'll make sure that the, that it's not aimed towards the kids, this particular one. Um, but that is quite cool if you think about it. I mean, you know, no death is ever good. But um, to chop someone from head to groin, essentially, rather than uh, just simply um, across the waist, uh, takes a lot of time and effort. So... Uh, so that is how Hesselrig is believed to have died at the hands of of Wallace, uh, rather than again how it did, how it went in the uh, in the in the film. I do have a couple of little things in here that that are that are nods to the film. I I, I really like the, the the sequences that then follow, showing the guerrilla warfare Trojan horse style tactics upon entering the compound before burning it down. Uh, I thought that was pretty well shot, and uh, you know again it just kind of. It's showing that the, the, the Scots are getting this kind of momentum um, and getting bigger and better at what they were doing. So uh, props to them for, for really showing that in, in quite a good way. And then we cut back to the two Edwards. So Edward II is shown as being a little less into fighting as his father by suggesting leaving Wallace simply to the magistrates. However, depicted in the same scene is the assumption that Edward II was gay, and I feel that was a little unfair, and it appears to show that gay people are weak. Um, gay, homosexual, sorry, uh, whichever whichever term uh, is, is most uh, welcome these days. Um, I, I think that whole thing is, is, to me, it's unfounded. A lot of people put that out there as fact. I, I, I don't believe that it is fact as such. Uh, I mean, if it was fair play, but um, you know, it's. It, I think the film really picks on that, and the on, and basically is showing that the only reason why Edward II didn't want to um, to to show force against Wallace was was because he was a weak man, and uh, you know, as the as the film goes on, we start to get this idea that that he was a homosexual so i i don't think that it's a, a very fair way of depicting the man um but there you go um and then there's a scene which i, I mean it's just a very very fleeting comment robert the bruce appears and states that wallace was just simply a commoner and wallace wasn't 
and just simply a commoner. He was um, he was the son of a knight, an unimportant son of an unimportant knight. But uh, you know, I mean, they weren't poor, but they weren't necessarily rich. They were kind of in that middle ground. Um, you know, they had lands and things like that by uh, by any means. So Wallace was not just simply a commoner. He was he was he was actually quite a uh, a high standing man of society. Uh, and then we have a conversation between Isabella and Isabella's favourite, uh, uh, and it's told that the English desecrated Wallace's father and brother's grave along with Murren's grave. Um, of course, uh, Murren, I mean Marion. Uh, there's no proof that this that this was ever an actual thing. It is quite likely that it that it could have been a thing back then, but there's no written proof to say uh, that that is true. And then we have probably one of my favourite scenes in the entire film, uh, where we are introduced to Stephen the Irishman. Uh, Stephen the Irishman, interestingly enough, is played by a Scotsman, and most of the Scots in the background of this film are played by Irishmen. Of course, the the, the main one is Hamish, that's Brendan Gleeson. Um, and then, of course, you've got Mel Gibson, the, uh, the Australian-American or American-Australian, whichever... Uh, I, I don't know which of the two countries wants to lay claim to Mel Gibson these days um, but uh, yeah a lot of the Scottish characters in the film are actually played by Irishmen and a lot of the Irishmen are actually played by Scots um, Stephen the Irishman was real uh, he does appear in the story um, probably not as crazy as depicted in the film, uh, but he was and did form part of uh, Wallace's army. And the reason why that information is out there is because the Irish, uh, as well as we're going to kind of go into a little bit, um, Irish people didn't really sympathise with the Scots at all um, at that particular time. So um, it's interesting that an Irishman would be part of Wallace's army. And that brings us on to uh, the first battle of the film, uh, there's really only two battles of the on in the film, but uh, the Battle of Stirling Bridge is then depicted. Um, in the film, it's just a, a screen with a field that just says Stirling. It doesn't say the Battle of Stirling Bridge, so they're not advertising it as the Battle of Stirling Bridge, but of course, William Wallace and Andrew de Murray, they, uh, their most famous military victory uh, was at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, so we can only guess that uh, that's what this is supposed to be depicting and of course we have no bridge in the film mel gibson did come uh, over here i believe it was in uh, late 1995 or or 1996 to to do press for the film um it, it's actually quite interesting on the 19th of may which uh, was just yesterday um was the american premiere of the film it was premiered in los angeles it wasn't released in the uk until september um of 1995 but uh so you know i think that's that worked out quite well it, it totally totally unplanned i uh, just saw it on the internet the other day um so mel gibson when he was over for this little press release was asked by a sterling local why a bridge was not used in the film gibson's reply was the bridge got in the way, to which the local replied, aye, that's what the English found. So, of course, um, you know, if you go back and listen to the, the episode about William Wallace, you'll understand why that is funny, uh, because the bridge was used by the Scots uh, against the English, almost as a weapon of its own, the bridge for the English got in the way, so... Uh, so, despite it being one of the most iconic speeches in movie history, there is no proof that such a speech was given. If so, then it was made most likely by the army's leader at the time, Andrew de Maury. Now, Wallace and de Maury before the Battle of Stirlingbridge were actually based upon the Abbey Craig, which is where the William Wallace Monument stands today. So, the likelihood is the instructions were given and the Scots rushed out of the the woods uh, round about there rather than being in plain open sight to the English because it was kind of an, an ambush by the Scots. So the, the the English would not have known that the Scots were there. So I, I really highly doubt there would have been a speech. If there was, there would have been probably the night before 
rather than in the lead up to the battle, but an absolutely iconic scene from movie history. The Scots under Wallace uh, never wore woad on their faces. This is uh, another one. Um, of course, again, it's been parodied in thousands of films, including South Park, etc., where, you know, Mel Gibson turns up and he's got the blue on his face and uh, and stuff like that. Uh, this is, so the idea of this is called woad, W-O-A-D, and it was worn by the Picts. Um, the Picts were named by the Romans as the Picts, uh, which means the painted people. Or the painted ones, they would paint themselves and tattoo themselves uh, to show who they were. So that's where the idea comes from. But at the time, they they wouldn't have done this. It's more likely if they if they did cover themselves in anything, it was probably more likely dirt um, to hide within the trees and you know as camouflage sort of thing. Uh, so the idea of uh, wearing the the blue paint on their face uh, very unlikely. Uh, the long spear defence that happens within the within the film, you know, the famous hold, hold, etc., is a likely nod to the Sheltrons that were used. However, uh, it's not confirmed whether or not Sheltrons were used at the Battle of Stirling Bridge because, again, it was more like an ambush. Um, the Sheltrons were, were definitely used at the Battle of Falkirk in the following year in 1297. Um, sorry, pardon me, 1298. But um, that's kind of where the idea of these uh, these big spears came from. Uh, the battle that's actually depicted in the film is more akin to Bannockburn uh, and how Bannockburn went. So uh, without the big pits and trenches and tar and uh, and and again noticeable uh, lack of a river, but uh, the battle that takes place within Braveheart is more like Robert the Bruce's victory at uh, at Bannockburn instead. So after the battle uh, and after the, the victory, uh, Wallace is then seen being knighted and appointed as the Guardian of Scotland. Uh, some believe that it might actually have been Robert the Bruce who was the man who knighted Wallace, uh, just with the records in which we have, um, because at the time, a lot of the Scottish nobles were actually out of the country, a lot of them down in England and fighting with uh, Edward I in France at the time. So Robert the Bruce was believed to have been in the country at that particular time, therefore he would have been the highest ranking noble within the country in order to knight someone. So it's quite likely that Robert the Bruce was the man who knighted Wallace, but there you go. Uh, we then see Wallace and the Scots army invading England, um, but he's depicted as heading to York. This is unlikely, bordering on untrue. However, there is an account uh, that I have read that does uh, state that Wallace decapitated the Duke of York, just as happened in the film. The problem is, is someone's probably taken this film, literally written it down in a book, I've read it, or on a on a on an internet page, I've read it and and taken that as uh, as true. So I'm just saying that it it probably didn't happen, but there are accounts that state that it did. Uh, we then see, of course, the events after Stirling Bridge with uh, Edward returning from France and throws Edward the Second's favourite Philip. Well, uh, he's called in the film from the window. Uh, Edward's favourite was actually called Piers Gaveston and was not killed by Edward I. Uh, Piers Gaveston died long after uh, Edward I died himself. We then see William Wallace meeting the Princess of France, uh, Isabella, the wife now, of course, of Edward II. And... Um, that did not happen, as uh, again we can allude, to, or, or again as I alluded to back in, uh, back at the beginning, uh, she would have been three years old in 1298. Um, so it's highly unlikely that she would have met up with William Wallace. Certainly, uh, she introduces herself as the Princess of Wales as well, a title not created until 1307, two years after Wallace's death. So now we see the English preparing for the Battle of Falkirk. 
uh, and a council of war being called in Edinburgh. Uh, this unlikely happened, especially any involvement between Wallace and Bruce. Bruce, sorry, Wallace refers to Bruce as the rightful leader and the rightful king, etc. But Wallace was actually a supporter of John Balliol. He didn't believe that Balliol had been completely deposed. They were fighting, and Wallace himself specifically was fighting to have John Balliol placed back on the throne of Scotland. Bruce is then seen talking to the man in the tall tower, uh, the man who we believe has leprosy, that of course being his father. Bruce, so he's then seen talking to his father and is being told to betray Wallace, making Bruce appear unable to make his own decisions. Yeah, this I, I don't like this depiction whatsoever of, of Robert the Bruce or Robert the Bruce's father uh, at all. I think that um, Angus McFadgen himself, of course, being a, a Scot, he, I don't know why on earth he didn't pick up on any of this. Robert the Bruce was not an undecisive man in terms of, uh, you know, he made a decision and, and he would go out and do it. Fair enough, he did flip-flop between the two sides, between supporting Wallace and supporting the English. Uh, again, money and land involved here. Um, this makes sense at the time, and especially for a, a landowner and a possible heir to the throne in Robert the Bruce, but in the film, Bruce is spineless, absolutely spineless. Um, so uh, that's my opinion on that particular bit. Uh, we then, uh, of course, have the Battle of Falkirk, and again, quite an iconic scene from the film is the Scots and the Irish uh, uh, joining together in the middle of the battlefield, shaking hands, etc., Again, completely false. Uh, Ireland was under Edward's rule at that particular time and the Irish probably hated the Scots as much as the English did. Uh, maybe not necessarily hated, but again, did not really um, sympathise with the Scots at all uh, at that particular time. Uh, we see tar on the field uh, was not set alight as in the film, but the Scots were set up in five or so sheltrons. So the Scots are depicted as pouring tar and then lighting it on fire on the uh, battlefield. But we had five or maybe slightly more than that very large sheltrons, these um, circular hedgehog style defences. Uh, and they were defeated not through hand-to-hand -hand combat, but by Edward's longbowmen. Wallace flees in the film after Edward I. So uh, when Wallace tries to flee the battlefield, he sees Edward I leaving. Wallace did not get on a horse and start chasing after King Edward. He did not do that at all. He just fled. He got out of Dodge as quickly as he possibly could. Um, but then... Wallace is seen battling the, the Black Knight. The Black Knight is sent to um, protect the king, I'm pretty sure the, the phrase was. And it turns out that the Black Knight was Robert the Bruce. Uh, again, utter nonsense, this particular scene. However, again, as I mentioned in the actual episode, uh, it is likely that Robert the Bruce was part of Edward's reserve army at the Battle of Falkirk. So Robert the Bruce at the time was most likely on the side of Edward I at that particular time, was probably at the Battle of Falkirk, but did not stand alongside Edward. He was probably in the woods with a reserve army waiting for further instructions. Wallace did not kill the noble in his bed as depicted. Probably this is from the story of how William Wallace killed Heselrig. Uh, so again we have this famous scene where Wallace breaks into a noble's house, he's got a mace and he smacks the guy and then he and his horse jump out the window. Just a little note on the horses in the film, you do see a lot of the horses being stabbed and killed and falling down on the on the battlefields etc. The horses were all fake, they were um, hydraulically powered and uh, Peter the, the animal rights uh, activists um, were calling for people to boycott the film because of the treatment of the uh, um, of the animals uh, until they were shown all of the backstage footage, um, behind the scenes footage of uh, of the horses and how real they looked, and uh, eventually they uh, they kind of dropped their 
vendetta against the film in a way. So throughout the kind of next part of the, of the film, we, we've got Wallace on the run, uh, but we never see him in Europe. Again, probably time constraints and budget restraints, etc. for the film, but uh, he's only ever shown in the highlands of Scotland, uh, and we know that Wallace spent time in France and Italy uh, and was out of Scotland for about four years. Uh, one thing, the only date that's really given in the entire film is that bit right at the beginning where it says 1280. That's the only date that's that's really given in the film. The the, the rest of it, I think, I think it says 1314 for the uh, for the end scenes with uh, Robert the Bruce leading the, the Scots into battle at Bannock Burn. Um, but uh, but yeah, so so Wallace was actually gone for around four years. The nobles are then sent by Robert the Bruce to join the fight, but Wallace is betrayed. Probably the most absurd part of this film to suggest that Bruce, or even Bruce's father, had anything to do with Wallace's capture. The real betrayer was John de Menteith, a Scottish lord who had sworn oath to Edward in lieu of land and money. Um, the idea that Robert the Bruce was involved in Wallace's betrayal is, uh, again, is, is without a doubt probably the most um, critical part of this film um, it is totally untrue I mean why would Scotland's greatest king have betrayed Scotland's national hero so coming towards the end of the film we have Wallace on trial uh, Wallace on trial was more grand than it was depicted in the film it took place in the large Westminster Hall and not in a very small damp room uh, as it seems to happen in the film uh, and Wallace was never at any point offered mercy or a quick death. The trial was long, it was very convoluted, uh, there was over 130 different charges read out for Wallace. Wallace never really spoke in the, uh, uh, in the courtroom either. He probably wasn't allowed to speak in the courtroom. Uh, apparently a, a crown was placed upon... A, a, crown of thorns i think it was placed on his head um during his execution etc the, the the trial was just a show trial it was a mockery you know and it wasn't uh, wasn't anything kind of to be read into um and kind of lastly edward the first was not a month away from death uh, i know that isabella says that in the film uh, that edward the first was a month away from death um edward lived on for another Two years after the death of Wallace, so Edward the Edward the First, pardon me, definitely does not die when Wallace screams the um, that immortal line, "Freedom," in the film. So yeah, um, it was kind of very hastily put together and uh, and what have you. But Braveheart as a film is excellent. If you've not seen it, go and watch it. It is an absolutely fantastic film in terms of entertainment. Probably a solid seven, maybe a seven, seven and a half out of ten, I would give it. Um, in terms of its historical accuracy, however, you know, one, maybe 1.2 out of ten. It's it, it's not very uh, historically accurate at all, but in all fairness to them, they did come out and say it's a it's a reimagining of the story, etc. But uh, I mean, they've made some very, very, very monumental mess ups in that film. So, so again, if you haven't seen it, go and watch it. Um, I mentioned the film Robert the Bruce, uh, the kind of the sequel in in a way with Angus McFadden. Um, I think I posted it on the. Um, on the the Facebook page, uh, my recommendation is do not waste two hours and watch that film. It was uh, terrible, quite simply. Uh, but Braveheart, it's uh, some very good entertainment. It brought forth a lot of uh, amazing things for Scotland, you know, with the um, the tourism industry, and it got people like myself interested in Scottish history at a young age. Uh, I remember I would have been. Eight years old when the film came out, uh, so you can you can do your maths there. Uh, so eight years old when that film came out, 
and as soon as it came out on VHS, uh, my dad went down and uh, rented it, and we watched it pretty much immediately. Uh, it was uh, I'd, I'd remember it vividly, uh, watching it for the first time. So it is a great film. Get ahead and watch it if you haven't already. So next up is um, a little announcement in terms of how I'm going to be continuing on with the podcast. Um, I'm going to be, from the release of this particular podcast, I'm going to be taking roughly a two-week break. The reason why I'm going to be taking a two-week break is I'm not really taking a break. There's only going to be a break from uploading podcasts. What I want to do is I want to start writing a podcast, recording the podcast and having it ready to be released at least a week in advance. Or uh, So if I take two weeks off, I will have one written this week and recorded, ready to post up in two weeks so that I'm keeping ahead of myself. Uh, so in order to do that, I need to kind of get a little break, get ahead of myself um, so that I can just record uh, as and when so that I'm not missing an upload date. So uh, so that's basically what's going to be happening. So from just now, there's not going to be a podcast for a couple of weeks. I know I've already had a kind of week and a half off. I did I did write this podcast about three or four days ago. Um, I'm only just getting around to recording it just now um, with uh, time, etc., and things going on in, in, in our lives. So that's what's going to be happening. So there's just there's just going to be a, a little break in between hand. Um, if I can, I'll be, you know, on the socials. I'm always available uh, via email. I want to thank everybody who's been emailing. I also want to thank all of those, uh, all of those of you who have decided to pledge on the Patreon page. It is absolutely magnificent. Uh, that you have chosen to do so uh, I'm, I'm loving the emails and, and, and I love communicating with with everyone um, through the emails and through Patreon etc hopefully with getting on a little bit ahead of myself as well we might be able to do some early releases perhaps on the Patreon so for those of you that, that sign up can get the, the, um, the episodes a little bit earlier than everyone else but you know, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's that's that's how it goes. Um, on top of that, if you wouldn't mind just taking a, a little second um, out of your day just to to share the podcast. Uh, nowadays, if you're on Facebook and if you like the Facebook page, nowadays the the the, the podcasts are being uploaded in a kind of video form on Facebook, so you can just click on share. That's all you need to do. Click share. A box will come up asking you if you want to share. Click yes. That's it. You don't need to write a little blurb. You can if you've got an extra two seconds. Um, but if you wouldn't mind just sharing it, that's that's all we need. We just need it shared around to as many people as possible. Um, I want to see if we can get up to 500 listeners uh, roughly a week on, uh, on the podcast. I mean, we're getting roughly 200 a day. Um... On upload day, I can usually see it around about 380 to 420 um, in one day, uh, which is amazing as it is. Um, but the more people that get into the podcast, the better. Um, you know, I love listening to podcasts. Clearly, if you're listening to this, you love listening to podcasts as well. So share it around and get on the Facebook page, give it a like. If uh, you go onto the YouTube page, Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the YouTube channel as well so that you get um, the constant updates, uh, notifications as to when a new episode goes live. Um, again, we're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Deezer. Um, there are a few others. Uh, hit me up on the Twitter. Uh, pretty much all of these are um, forward slash Scott History Pod, etc. Um, so the website is libsyn.com, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com, forward slash Scott History Pod. Twitter, at Scott History Pod. Facebook.com, forward slash Scott History Pod. YouTube.com, forward slash Scott History Pod. Or just go to Google, type in the Scottish History Podcast. It's all there. Even uh, when you're searching on iTunes or on Spotify, you can just type in Scott History Pod and it will it will bring me up. 
so uh, you know go there and if you wouldn't mind leaving some reviews thumbs up and uh, write some comments give me some uh, some some comments as well i think uh, you know the the reaction has been absolutely fantastic uh, so yeah and one last little announcement before i go here the podcast now officially has a theme song um my very good friend graham watt at uh, eight acre films and of uh, of of a band i play in um i sent him an email uh, or a message a couple of weeks ago saying ah, you know how do you fancy giving this a bash he's given it a bash and uh, and, I, and i love it so uh, at the end of this episode very very shortly you'll be hearing the scotland uh, the scottish history podcasts new theme song which will be played at the beginning and end of each episode uh so once again folks thank you very much for listening it's been a pleasure so i will uh, basically speak to you in a couple of weeks thank you now see you later